6.05, meeting is now called to order. Lieutenant, can you please uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Item number three, establishment of crime. Rene Rodriguez is absent. Maria Reyes. Here. Ralph Duran. Here. Mayor Elia Garcia. Here. Victor Perez. Here. Ivan Colon Villalobos. Here. Mayor, we have a quorum. Item number four, public comment. We have several speakers. Our first speaker is David Estrada. Mr. Estrada, you have three minutes. Um, David Estrada, and uh, I would like to ask you for permission on item number 10, which a lot of the people that are present today, uh, we're here for item number 10. I'd like for you to extend um, my time during that item. We have a PowerPoint presentation and it's probably going to take about five, six minutes. So I'd ask you to, to please consider that. Uh, it's very respectful PowerPoint, nothing bad, but uh, it has some pictures in there, and uh, pictures are worth a uh, thousand words. Ms. Reyes? Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and uh, move item number 10 to after the, uh, or is it, do you want it before the presentation? Or after the presentation? After public comment? After public comment? Okay, after public comment. Will, will you extend the time other than the, than just three minutes for the presentation? I second. Where can we place it, Mr. Martinez? At the public comment. At the public comment? Okay, thank you. Mr. Duran? Uh, couldn't we place it after number five because we have the uh, school board here or a lot of people from the school board and that way they can do their presentation and then move on? Thank you. Okay. No other comments right now. Mr. Estrada? You have three minutes. Salvador Herrera. Bernie Salcido. Mr. Salcido, you have three minutes. Thank you. Ms. Mayor Garcia, Council, and Legal. Uh, we're here tonight on item number 10, once again, for the Rancho Medieval Estates, and we're opposing the development to come through our streets and use those as the main through fares. We do not currently meet the size of the street for that type of uh, traffic. Uh, there's an ordinance here that you all have for collector streets to be minimum 35 feet. Tres Caballos is 30 foot wide or five foot short in that. And that's the one that's gonna be impacted the most. I don't think it'd be safe to do that at this time. I think we need to put the infrastructure in place. Uh, this developer needs to acquire their own easements. They need to acquire their own roadways that will lead into North Loop for safety purposes. Uh, and then I would like to refrain some more additional time we can, for item number 10 under the uh, PowerPoint presentation, if you would. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Damien Pilatsky. Oh. 
You have three minutes, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, other uh, distinguished members. I'm Damien Plasky. I'm a resident of Rancho Miraval Estates. I'm also here because I want to speak on item 10. But one of the things that I've seen in the process has caused me alarm about the process uh, that we're going, that this uh, has gone through. And that is that the developer was asked to produce a traffic assessment. That traffic assessment then was done and accepted, but it is so obviously a flawed that it makes me wonder what the acceptance uh, criteria was. I live on a street that has maybe 100 cars that travel down it. We have a stop sign onto North Loop, and sometimes we have five or six cars waiting up to 15 minutes to get onto North Loop. If we have this development go through and drive on our ranch, on uh, Rancho Viejo Drive, some additional thousand cars, we have maybe 1,200 cars going through trying to exit onto North Loop because that is really the only route that they would have. That's, you know, 10, 20 times as many cars waiting in line. Could be up to 120 cars. The assessment stated that there would be minimal impact. Having 120 cars backing up uh, half a mile to three quarters of a mile down Rancho Viejo, or Rancho Viejo Drive, taking over an hour to get onto North Loop, and it's going to get worse as traffic continues to increase on North Loop. That is not minimal uh, impact, and for the process to accept the report as it was written, uh, when it's so obviously flawed, uh, makes me concerned about the process. I would also like to have some time to speak uh, during the, our poor item number 10. Thank you. Lincoln Wallace. Mr. Wallace, you have three minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all for your service, first of all. Um, my name is Lincoln Wallace. I currently own a house uh, on Tierra Este, which is the intersection of Tierra Fertil and Edgemere by El Dorado High School. My wife and I currently, are currently also own a house on 415 Rancho Viejo, which we purchased in June. We have yet to move in because we're renovating uh, the house. Last night, I gave Mr. Salcedo a call after receiving uh, the notice of this meeting, and that's why I'm here. So I have very little um, information pertaining to the overall project itself. But some of the things that I've already observed uh, with my limited exposure to the area is um, the infrastructure as currently um, stated. With one street going in to a, to a, uh, to a dead end, if you will, uh, opening one more street uh, with the traffic backed up, there's nowhere else to go. I currently experience where I'm at, uh, trying to get on to Edgemere, uh, it's almost as if you're playing Frogger at times, the old video game, where every time you, you get to the stop sign, you're putting your own life in, in your own hands, okay? Um, I understand the challenges when it comes to development. We want to encourage that. But as I was uh, crossing the street here, I was humbled uh, looking for a place and a crosswalk to simply get across the street, okay? So I understand on one hand, this is a small community, but before we invite outside investors uh, ensuring that our current infrastructure is up to par before we invite more growth seems like a more responsible thing to do. Not to say that I don't encourage it, but there's a process that should be examined. And as the gentleman brought up previously, getting on the highway here before five o'clock, it was already a traffic jam. And for a traffic assessment to be done between the hours of 07 and three o'clock or 3.30 doesn't seem real reasonable when we all know that the traffic doesn't get heavy until about five o'clock. So that is the very first step that I'm looking at going, okay, what else are we looking at here uh, when, it, when it comes to going forward? So like I said, I understand the challenges of growth, but I would like to just say and to continue to encourage you that uh, before we do that, let's look at the, those people that we have here and what issues that they are already experiencing. And if we're having people come into the community then ask them to take up those extra steps to ensure the people that are already here, their investment is also protected. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, for the record, Mr. René Rodriguez walked into the meeting at 610. Jesus Cabrera.
Mr. Cabrera, you have three minutes. Um, Jesus Cabrera, and I live in uh, Tres Caballos, right on the street that the, the, this developer that wants to get in. And I don't think it's fair. We've been working all these streets for ourselves, take care of the streets. All this community has been very peaceful, peaceful. No complaints about the, you know, criminality or something like that. And um, that developer has a lot of money. They can do roads whatever they want. They can buy some rat, they can buy anywhere. Just what I'm asking, this is hopefully the last time. We've been dealing this for a year. I'm getting tired of this. And um, what I want is to tell you the development has a lot of money. So they can make roads. They, on the last meeting, last uh, week or two weeks ago, on, on planning and zoning, they don't have a plan for schools. They don't have a plan for security. They don't have a plan for fire department. Besides, our roads is not enough even for a evacuating in case of a fire. So the only thing I'm asking is tell the developer to do their own roads, buy Surratt uh, properties to, to get more roads. They need over 60 feet wide uh, roads. Just leave it alone. Leave us alone. And one thing I just want to remember you, myself and all these people, both for you. And that's why you sit in there to make a wise decision. I think this is your turn. That's all what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy Salcedo. Ms. Salcedo, you have three minutes. Yes, my name is Sandy Salcedo. Good evening. I don't live in the world. I, I don't live there, but I live in Patty Jones Horizon. And I understand the, the, the problem is the problem is all the traffic. What about us in Horizon Boulevard? We can't even get out through Patty Jones. So we already have all that traffic. What's going to happen then? All this is, is done with all that traffic. And another thing, we don't even have enough policemen to take care of all that traffic if there's an accident. So I'm asking you, please do something about it. Don't pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Joey Sanchez. Mr. Sanchez, you have three minutes. Thank you. I'm here with everybody here on item number 10 as well. Uh, I'm, I agree with them all. We don't have the infrastructure in place to help this big subdivision. In. I'm okay with growth. I think it's a good thing, but there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And I want you all to consider the right thing. We need other things in place. We need the one sewer, water, better roadways. I mean, what's in place now doesn't work with what we have there. Can you imagine with all the other people there? We'll just make it that much more worse. Yeah, the solution they say may be a stoplight. It's only going to make it worse because now you're going to be backing up more people. Not only there at Rancho Viejo, Anderson Road, North Loop, it's just going to make it even more of a cluster. I think there's other options. I think they need to be looked into more. And I don't think we should make a decision tonight. I think you should research it some more and uh, make a better decision. I understand progress is coming and we ain't going to stop. And it's a good thing for all of us, but we need to do it the right way and think of everybody else, not just one developer. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Naomi Scott. Ms. Scott, you have three minutes. Uh, yes, hi. I'm also a constituent, and I also live on Rancho Viejo. Like we all stated, we have been here for over a year just battling this agenda here. On the last visit that we had here, we had the recommendations of the planning and zoning as to what needed to be met. It was denied for those reasons because they felt that there was more that needed to be done. The infrastructure, the soil drainage, the soil analysis, the traffic analysis, the environmental, 
the covenants of them, the restrictions, the construction schedules. There was so much that was asked of them to do before we could even do anything. I'm hearing that maybe they already did the traffic analysis. I, this is the first thing I've heard of it. I don't agree with what came out of it, if that is correct, because I felt that it was done maybe on the wrong hours. Uh, we hired you all to listen to us. We put you here to listen to the city of here at Socorro. Uh, I understand that there is growth. We want growth, but we need to be consistent, and we need to do things right for for everybody, not just one builder. We cannot bend the rules for one builder. This is a time where we need to stop and put impact, impact everything that needs to be done right and don't bend and make sure that we're consistent with everyone that comes into the city of Socorro so that we don't run into all these issues that we have right now. We have so many issues with drainage right now, with traffic. We can't even meet our own demand, what we have right now with the citizens that we have here. I can't imagine what y'all are going to create for us that live here and yourselves because we're trying to make, get, make a little bit more money. We need to balance. We need to do things right. Please listen to your constituents. We put you here for a reason. You are our voice. Please listen. Thank you. Johnny Tellez. Salvador Griego. Jose González. Mr. González, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Council. <clears throat> I've been a resident of this area for approximately three years now. Um, when my wife and I first purchased the, the property there on Dante River, it was a barren lot. We built our house uh, from scratch. <clears throat> because we like the neighborhood and the community, the tranquility and the peace there, it's, it's just amazing. <clears throat> and uh, we, like, like they said, we've been fighting this battle for a little over a year now. And uh, it, it's just the infrastructure that we have available to us now can't handle the traffic that's, that, that we have currently. And I'm not just talking about Rancho Villa for the Calais. It's already on the north loop. So once we build all those houses and that traffic starts coming through our community, I mean, it, it's just unfair to put the, the people of Rancho Villa for drive through that. Some of these people have been there for 30 years. I've only been there three. But I just ask you to please take that into consideration. I mean, we, our children are going up there. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just unfair. You guys are here for us, and we, we expect you to listen to us. We expect you to, to carry out our wishes. That, that's what you're here for. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Valdez. Mr. Valdez, you have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, my name is Tony Valdez. I'm a resident of uh, Rancho Marival, uh, off of Rancho Viejo. And I think that there's a lot of uh, people here who have um, demonstrated and showed, and we will show uh, during the PowerPoint presentation, some of the flaws that, that um, I've seen uh, while living there. I've lived there for over uh, approximately 14 years. And we've heard time and time again the, the flaws, the the traffic, the infrastructure, the, the, the schools that are necessary to, to be available before we even start thinking about expanding that area. That area is basically considered agricultural area. I mean, and the houses there that we have are usually about half, uh, well, an acre to more than one acre. So these are big lots, and the lots that are proposed are not going to be that big. So we have a, now we have a place where we can call home. And we, myself, talking about myself and my family, we have enjoyed living there. And we hope to keep on enjoying that type of living conditions, which it's very difficult to find now here in El Paso. There's only a few places. So it's up to you to set the precedence here, to set the legacy, because whatever you do right now is going to, reflect in the future and whatever mistakes you make they're also going to show 
So hopefully you will make the right decision. And uh, I'm requesting additional time later on during the PowerPoint presentation as well. So please, make the right decision. I know that you can do it. I have faith in you. Thank you. Mayor, and those are all our speakers. Item number five, presentation by Daniel Escobar from Socorro Independent School District regarding bond 2017. Yes, Mayor Garcia and Council, thank you for allowing us the time to, to uh, speak to you about the Socorro Independent School District bond. My name is Jose Espinosa, the proud, proud superintendent of Socorro ISD, and I know there's some, uh, couple of, there's some individuals here that I'd like to quickly introduce, starting off with our board president, Mr. Paul Guerra, who lives off of North Loop, by the way. Um, also, we have some awesome, awesome principals in our school district, starting off with Mr. Josh Tovar, the principal of Socorro High School, right here in the front. Mr. Tovar, could you please stand so they can see you in the back? The Go Bulldogs, I see, there you go. I see Ms. Rosie Vasquez from Campestre Elementary, Go Cobras, Ms. Macias from Rojas Elementary, Ms. Herrera from Waco, Mr. Guerrero from Socorro Middle, and Mr. Olvera from Serna, uh, and uh, Hilly, he has a function. Oh no, he did make it. Mr. Miranda from Hilly. See, Ms., uh, Mr. Aguirre from Escontrias. And Sanchez is not here. Sanchez. Ms. Acosta is right over here from Sanchez Middle School. Did I miss anybody? And, I was, and we have some awesome employees from our school district as well. Could you just, just wave your hand, guys? Thank you so much for <laughs> representing. Thank you. So, myself and Ms. Macias just want to take some time to share with you what's on the November 7th ballot, and it's the Socorro Independent School District bond. So I wanna just quickly go through it. I believe we are, we ready? We are not ready, so we're waiting for a password. All right. I'll, I'll go ahead and begin while they're getting the password set up. Here. So a little bit about our school district. In Socorro ISD, we now have over 46,500 plus students. 46,500 plus students. We are a destination school district. We continue to grow. To give you an idea, compared to last year, we just finished our ninth week of school. We have about 600, 700 more students this year than what we had last year. And the same thing happened the year before and the same thing happened the year before. So we have, again, as you can see on the screen, over 46,500 plus students. We have 47 campuses. Families, parents across El Paso are taking notice. They want to bring their little ones to one of our 47 schools because they know, they fully understand the type of education that they're children are going to receive when they bring them to Socorro ISD. So people in El Paso are taking notice, but people across the state of Texas are also taking notice. You know, I am from Houston, Texas, and most of the population lives in Central, that triangle from Dallas to Austin, San Antonio, over to Houston. And when I moved out here, I sometimes feel that people in Central, East Texas, North, forget about good old El Paso, specifically Socorro. And when I saw this video, when they were talking about the, the, the school districts who have high academic performance at low cost, it really made me proud. It's a video about two minutes and 45 seconds. This is the, in Austin, Texas, the Senate Committee on Education. So if we can.
So that was in the Texas Senate Committee on Education, and there's a lot said there, you know, but one of his last comments, most people wouldn't put a district like Socorro in that top box when you compare them to some of the districts across the state of Texas, over 1,200 reasons being, oh, it's a border district, oh, there's lots of uh, English language learners, uh, there's a lot of, it's a my, predominantly minority population, but we have awesome principals like we have, awesome board members like Mr. Guerra, awesome students and parents, you know, we'll show Austin, Texas and Central Texas, East Texas what we can do. So people across the state are, are, are taking notice, so it makes me proud as, 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 as a superintendent to see it being, uh, you know, no, noticed statewide. So now, a little bit about the bond. You know, when, when people hear the word bond, first thing that pops in people's minds many times is, well, what's my tax rate gonna be? And that's what we're here giving that information. But also what work would be done if the bond passes. And I personally have done about 80 of these presentations to get the word out to as many people as possible. That doesn't even count the meetings and that, that principals have had, that cabinet members have had. So we've done quite a bit of number of presentations and entertain any questions, concerns that the community may have. So, uh, you know, we say we got to get out to the city of Socorro. So again, thank you for allowing us uh, the time. So, so it's a $448.5 million bond that the, tr the trustees approved on August 15th a $448.5 million bond. And what work would be done? Our FAC committee, which you see on the screen, our facilities advisory committee, they did a facilities history. They met the entire summer. They got on a bus and they toured campuses. They toured our warehouse that's not too far from here on by Serna on Tanton Road. And they made a recommendation of $615 million, a $615 million bond. The, trees, the trustees saw it, said, oh my goodness, that'd be it's a lot of money. It would be a huge tax burden on our taxpayers. They prioritize it down to $448.5 million on August 15th. So what work would be done? The FAC priority, our Facilities Advisory Committee, and our trustees priority was the reconstruction of Socorro High School. And many of you all know Socorro High School is our oldest high school in Socorro ISD. It was built over 50 years ago. And over 50 years ago, it was actually built as a middle school. You compare the facilities, Socorro High School, you take a drive to Pebble Hills or East Lake area, it's like night and day. Our students, we want them to have the same type of, of opportunities. We want them to have the same type of, of facilities. It doesn't matter what part of the district that they live on. So the reconstruction of Socorro High School, uh, that's, that was a top priority, of, as I said, of our trustees and our fact committee. Okay, so other work that would be done if the bomb passes on November 7th, which early voting begins on Monday, October 23rd. We are a destination district, and sometimes, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty nice to be part of, an, uh, of a growing district, but there's some challenges, and there's some scary, scary situations, and specifically in the Pebble Hills area of Socorro ISD and the East Lake area of Socorro ISD, if you haven't taken the time or you, maybe you've driven by, you see all those roads that they are making, all these homes that are going up, subdivisions left and right. As a superintendent, as board members, the scary part is oh, all these homes are being built, families are coming in because they want to bring their little ones to Socorro ISD. The question is, where are we going to put all these students? And to give you an example, Butler Elementary, Lujan Chavez Elementary, if you were to buy a home right across the street at one of those two schools and you take your child, your kinder child, your second grade child to enroll at Butler or Lujan, that school will probably tell you, congratulations on your new house, but there's no more room for your child at my school. There's no more room. We have to overflow you because every single classroom is at capacity. So we overflow them to other schools in our district, Chester Jordan, uh, Purple Heart, Antoine, and they're gonna receive just as an amazing education at those schools as they would at Butler or Lujan. But I just believe that if you buy a home, you should be able to go to your neighborhood, your neighborhood school. And to give you the number, we have in Socorro ISD over 1,300 students, 1,300 students that are overflowed, that they just can't attend their neighborhood school. 
that we have to provide the transportation for, for many of them. Some of them, their parents will take them on their own. But 1,300 that cannot attend their neighborhood schools. So three schools would be built, one elementary school in the Pebble Hills area, a middle school in the East Lake area, and an elementary school in the East Lake area as well. Other work that would, be, um, that would be done if the bomb passes, these 16 schools that you see there on the list, and it's all of the elementary schools here in the Socorro feeder pattern, you see Campestre, Escontrillas, Hilly, Waco, uh, Rojas, um, and uh, did I miss one? Escontrillas, Those, these schools, along with the other ones, they don't have multi-purpose rooms. And a multi-purpose room is those, you can see, if you can hopefully make out that picture, it's basically a small gymnasium for students. That's a picture of Mission Ridge Elementary and also um, Sioux Shook Elementary. These multi-purpose rooms are very valuable for many reasons, but let me give you one reason. If it's cold outside or if it's inclement weather, you know, it's too windy or too hot outside, well, if you're at Sioux Shook, come on, we'll continue our physical activities in our multi-purpose room. If you're at Rojas, if you're at Hilly or Campestre, one of these 16 schools, they have to play, some coaches, they put them on a stage, some coaches, they'll take them in a small classroom, all the kids just crammed in there, pop a health video in, and, and, and watch the health video. Another coach says, well, I, do, I find an empty hallway, try to do some type of activity. Where if you're at these other schools, you know, they, they, continue their physical, they can continue their physical activities in these multi-purpose rooms. So 16 multi-purpose rooms would be built, and again, all of these uh, the school elementary schools here in the Socorro feeder pattern don't have any, and so every single school here would be receiving one. Other work that would be done, we have some awesome athletes, some amazing athletes in Socorro ISD, softball, baseball. As a matter of fact, last year our Socorro High School baseball team went three rounds deep in baseball. Those games start at 4 o'clock because there's no lights. Uh, at the softball fields and baseball fields. So if the bomb passes, lights would be added to softball, the softball fields in our, school in our high schools and our school district and along with our baseball fields as well. Also, a new student activity complex, an additional SAC. We have the beautiful SAC there on Joe Battle and Bob Pope. Beautiful. The, the only problem we have is that it was built in 1992. And it was built in 1992 when Socorro ISD had two high schools, Socorro High School and Montwood High School. So it was perfect. One football field, two schools, two football teams. The problem now is that in 2017, we have one football field and six high schools with Pebble Hills, El uh, uh, Dorado, uh, East Lake. We have six high schools now. Well, now it becomes a, a, an issue. Uh, specifically a scheduling issue. Now we have to schedule double hitters throughout the football season on Friday nights, two games. Once the first game starts at four, second one starts around 6.30, 7 o'clock. Sometimes we also have to schedule double hitters on Thursday. As a matter of fact, that happened last week and two games on Thursday, two games on Friday. The first weekend of football, Pebble Hills played Irving on a Thursday at four o'clock. And at four o'clock, these students have these football equipment on, the band, our amazing bands they have, they're in their band uniforms. Some of those instruments are pretty heavy. The cheerleaders, uh, the coaches, it is hot. It is hot. It's a safety issue. As a matter of fact, that first, that first day, one of our employees ended up in the hospital because he dehydrated. Um, so it's a scheduling issue. It also impacts instruction. You have 4 o'clock games. You have to pull the kids, the students, out of class early. And you all know students hate being pulled out of class early, right? Um, but they have to be pulled out of class early. So if the bomb passes an additional sack, a smaller one, as you can see on the screen, one that seats about 6,000 to 8,000 seats would be built. Now, Ms. Macias will continue with what other work would be done if the bomb passes along to uh, as well to address what the tax rate would look like for Socorro ISD. Mayor Garcia, city representatives, Maribel Macias. If the bond were to pass, we also have support services. The items for support services is we currently have our warehouse at Tanton Road. Um, our district is 135 square miles. Whenever we have our maintenance and operations and our technicians that start their day there, whenever they have a work order, oftentimes it takes them 35 minutes to an hour if they have to cross our district to do some of the work orders. So if the bond were to pass, we're looking at a centralized location. The other reason for the centralized location 
is that currently our warehouse metal facility built in 1960 when it rains outside it also rains a little bit inside and in that right top corner we have our NOC, our network operations center which are technology infrastructure so we at this point want to make sure that all of our information is secure so if the bond were to pass we would want to centralize that facility on the bottom we have transportation we currently have our mechanics amazing we have our fleet we have our base sometimes there are more buses or um, vehicles that need to be fixed so what they do they do great things they go outside of the bays they get the work done and they get the buses and vehicles back to rolling what we want to do is build another structure to ensure that they have enough facilities to to do the work that they do if the bond were to pass last year we had a group of technicians come and architects and what they did they went to pebble hills and to east lake we have people from across the state across the city going to see the great things that are happening inside the classrooms but they're also looking at the facilities and what they did is they made a checkoff list. What they did is they compared all of our high schools to Pebble Hills and to Eastlake, that 21st century learning. As you heard, Socorro, I Socorro High School would be reconstructed. Montwood, El Dorado, and Americas, we have a list of items that we would improve, again, that 21st century learning to ensure, um, which is the arts, which is STEM, science, technology, engineering, the arts, the math, the sciences. So all of our high schools would be comparable throughout our district. So every single um, student has the same opportunities. These are the items that we have and what we ask is we're giving you the data, the information. If you could share it with others, that way they could make an informed decision on November 7th. Hopefully earlier, we have early voting October 23rd through November 3rd. But that way they could make an informed decision for our $448.5 million bond reconstruction of Socorro High School, new construction. The one thing that I want to share with the new construction is what we did is we modified our boundaries. The reason we did that is as we're building the new buildings, we are not going to shut down or close down any existing facility. We're maximizing the use of every single facility we have in Socorro ISD. Athletic improvements, multi-purpose rooms, um, support services, and the high school improvements. One thing that is often asked is what about the tax rate? We've had the same tax rate for the past six years, and our board takes high, 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 um, how should I say it? Uh, they take pride in the fact that they want to ensure that we live within our means. When the Facility Advisory Committee came to them with a list of items, they wanted to ensure that we were still in that reasonable tax rate at $1.27. We have our maintenance and operations at 98 cents and 29 cents for our interest and sinking fund. If the bond were to pass, our interest and sinking fund would be the one that would increase. The one thing that we want to share is at $1.27, our total tax rate is currently below Canutillo, Isleta, El Paso, and Clint. If the bond were to pass, the impact would be 10.6 cents per $100 valuation. So if you have a $100,000 property valued, it would be at $8.83 per month or $105.96 per year. The one thing that our board looked at is if we add that 10.6 cents to our current tax rate, the total tax rate would be at $1.38, which is still below Canutillo, Isleta, El Paso, and Clint. As we're going to share this information, we want to ensure that our current citizens, 65 years and older, that they know that their taxes are frozen. When we presented just a couple of weeks ago, we had one of our parents that said, I have no idea, could you help me? So what we did is definitely, she came in, we went to the Central Appraisal District, shared the information with her on how to fill it out. I saw her the other day and she said that she officially filled out all the paperwork and it's submitted. So if you could help us also share that with our constituents. If they're 65 years and older, their taxes are frozen just to get the correct paperwork submitted. Election day is November 7th, early voting October 23rd through November 3rd. Um, and we would like your feedback. Um, we're here to serve you like you serve our, our district um, all the time. What can we do for you? My, my question is, I'm a question, my well, a 
question for you because I, I'm going to say my comments. But my question is, when you went out and, and talked to these individuals, um, what's the feedback you're getting? Do you break it down? Because when you showed us the PowerPoint, it, 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 from what we got presented at the committee, it's totally different what you're presenting because you're compounding everything into sports and, and education and stuff like that, but you don't really break it down. And one of the things that I've been asked, I've, I've been asked by 26 people a lot of questions. And because they, they've seen it on Facebook, we see it, you know, everywhere, the signs are up. So, of course, some of them ask me the same questions. But are you really telling them, giving them a definite breakdown of what it is? Because one of the concerns that I have, and the biggest concern, the, there's like three, but one of the biggest concerns is how long is it going to take to build Socorro High School? Because you're putting it at $135 million. And from what I was told, it, it might take three to four or five years to build. That's one of the things that people don't like, is that they don't want it uh, to go because there's some students that when it was getting an additional wing, um, some people were saying that it was very hectic for us to go to one side and then we see the changing fans and the dust and all of that. And there's a concern that their kids are now going to be put in that predicament. So what is the concerns that you're faced so far? Well, to, to address uh, your question, I have Mr. Anthony come up here to address the Socorro part. We do have it broken down. If you, um, this next slide has a website. If you go to the website, it has it at Americas. This is the work that would take place at um, El Dorado. This is the work. So it's more specific on, on our website. I mean, we could do it here, but it would be quite oh, no, a bit. I'm just, so yeah, people, that's a, yeah, that's a good point. That yeah. might have that same question, like what is, you know, $92 million right. is going to what? So I mean, so that they can also know, because that's what the purpose of you guys are here. Right, yeah. The good thing is that we have a, a good subdivision that that is here, and they can actually, you know, look at it. Um, and, and, and for their knowledge, uh, one of the things, one of the things that, uh, that uh, the concerns is the tax rate. Yes. Okay. Um, Maybe, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Rancho Viejo uh, uh, residents are, are going to be able to, you know, pony up an uh, additional $100 a, a month, but, you know, you need to really understand that as... It's $8 a month. Well, no, $8 a month, but a year. Yeah. So, so for a year, it's over $100. Yeah. So the majority of our constituency in Socorro have two jobs. Right. Some family members that I know, even their children have to work after school to help, you know, with the, with the bills. I mean, I, I get it. I understand, you know. But, I mean, that's something that is brought up to me all the time. We as a city haven't, haven't raised taxes for that same purpose. Even though we should, and we should be doing that since like four years ago every year because we can't maintain all of the projects. But yet... We, we 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 understand what what the burden of it's for our constituency, but I mean that's one of the things that I think you would have to address and let them know that one the high school and two the tax rate because that's something very important for the, the majority of the constituency. Let, let me have Mr. Anto talk about one of your questions about Socorro High School because that question does get asked a lot when we do these presentations about the timetable as far as for Socorro. Yes, good evening. I'm Tom Ington. I am the Chief Operation Officer for the uh, Score Independent School District. Uh, as far as any fast growing district that has to do bonds and stuff, we are, are always faced with large projects, uh, multi million dollar projects. Uh, East Lake and Pebble Hills were built in phases when the kids were on the campuses and stuff. Socorro would not be anything different. That's why we looked at it as a reconstruction. Uh, we're actually looking for some additional spaces around uh, Socorro High School, uh, but it will be designed. We'll start four projects immediately. Socorro High School will be one, the new elementary school in the Pebble Hills area, the new middle school uh, in the East Lake area, and then we'll start uh, the athletic or the SAC. Uh, but as far as the Pebble Hill, I mean the uh, Socorro High School goes, 
we figure that it's going, if it passes, it'll take nine months to a year to actually design it. And we are looking very, actually we're looking now at saving some of the existing building and stuff. So how is that gonna be phased into the new construction when we start reconstructing it? Uh, but any bond, uh, any district, and I've been doing this over 45 years, you know, you have to, large multi-million multi, multi uh, uh, dollar budgets, you have to phase them. Uh, we're not selling $448 million the first year. We're selling the $448 million in three separate sales. So we're only gonna get, I think it's $200 million the first year if it passes, and then it's divided up. Uh, so it, it is gonna be a phased project. We are gonna have to uh, uh, handle the students. And we understand that. And we've done that on all of our projects. We did uh, over 20 something renovations to uh, uh, elementary schools and middle schools where we dealt with kids in the buildings and stuff. So we're very aware of that. And we will you know, take that in consideration and stuff. Uh, but multi-million dollar projects like this, we do have to face them. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Van Oss? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think I, I understand where Mr. René is uh, saying that um, as a realtor, um, one of the, the first things that, you know, might disencourage the client from moving into that home is the tax, the tax portion of what their yearly taxes are. And so I know 8.83 per month does not seem a lot, but you'd be surprised how many people cannot afford that, especially here in Socorro. Cannot afford $8.83 because it's not just $8.83 here. It's $15 over here, it's 10 over here, it's 12 over there. Everything increases. And so it, now it's become, you know, now you have to save $200 extra a month just to survive. So, um, and I understand where you're coming from. And yes, I also have heard that when you guys uh, have some kind of project, whether it's an older school or a newer school, the residents that live along the, the line of the construction are always uh, inconvenienced and, and, and they're never listened to. So, and I understand where he's coming from. So, I just thought I'd add that, but um, good luck. Good luck uh, Thank you. To, to the project. I just wanna add that I'm not in no way, shape, or form, you know, you know, heckling you guys. I'm just saying that these are concerns that were brought up to me. Um, like I said, 26 individuals came up and said, hey, you know, what about this, what about that? Um, genuine concerns. You know, one of the biggest, like I said, was the school, how long is it gonna take, so forth. Uh, the other issue was the money that they were gonna have to, you know, pay in their taxes. Um, uh, some of the people that I hear, is like, uh, out of those 26, I think 18 of them said, wow, we're gonna need another stack. That's gonna cost us something about $17 million from what the notes that I had last time uh, in the committee. Um, I, I, you know, that's one of those things that they say, well, you know, you know, we, we understand that, that uh, the city is growing, but I mean, all the high schools are being built. They're, they're, they're building palaces up north, but we have so many old schools here that, you know, when, it, when it's time for them to revamp our thing, um, the majority of those, uh, 22 of them specifically said, well, they're gonna move everything away from Socorro where this is where they started. You know, so I mean, it's, it's one of those issues that our constituency has issues. Like I said, you know what, it's a good bond. It's a good bond, we need to rebuild Socorro. I, I understand that, you know, we, we need to, to uh, keep up with the times, with the growth, you know. Um, I'm just saying that those were the concerns. Like I said, we need the bond. We need the bond because, you know, it's our flagship. And that's what I tell people, it's our flagship. It's about time that we actually invest in our flagship because that's all we've got, you know? And I, and I, I, I will say it and I'll keep saying it, you know, it's a good bond. I know that there's some issues, you know, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, 
we just have to let people know that we are working at it and that you know it's it's the best for our community you know and uh, I don't know how the, the rest of, of the board feels but you know it's a good bond and it's about time you know what thank you thank you guys because it's uh it's about time Socorro is, is getting a, a face here, you know and uh, uh, I would like to say I would like to say before it's closing um, the next time we do have a committee, you know, I would love to see residents of Socorro because the only residents that I saw were up north, you know, um, so that we can have some input on, on the committee. That's, that's all. Is that where that? Yes. And let me add some on the, the high school process. I, I said it's going to take mm -hmm. nine months to year design. I'm not going to design it myself. <laughs> I am a registered architect. Uh, but we want input, and we'll have those, what we architects like to use terms of meet and, and call them threats. And we're going to involve Mr. Tovar and his, his administration. We're going to get students involved, and we want community people involved. So that whole process, that's why it's going to take nine months to a year to, to design that. So we want input. Good, good. Thank you. That's and, good. And, talk, and talking about uh, projections, I do have a question with regard to the turnaround time, and I understand that this is all projections, but once the design phase is passed, what are the projections for the actual phasing in of the construction for the, for the building? It would take, I'm gonna say at least minimum of two years, it could take three years. Uh, but my track record on, and I don't like to tote, my, my track record on the 2011 bond, we finished everything within a year and a half ahead of schedule and $37.5 million under budget. And my only concern is, as an educator, um, the transition time for the kids. Had, uh, and I remember our class was the first one to use the old junior high and the high school portion together. And there was a bear to get from one end of the building to the other. And so, as it is now, that's, that's an issue. And because of the, of, the, of the transfer or the transition time, that, that to me is also kind of uh, concern because we've got kids with heavy backpacks and those kinds of things and so that's one thing that I wouldn't want to make any longer than it absolutely has to. Yes and, and we'll definitely look at that but that's that was out of the nature of the it started out of the middle school right. and then it was added on added on added on and you know so hopefully in the reconstruction if, if it passes you know we condense it and combine it and, and, and provide more parking and access and, and accessibility. Thank you. Ms. Reyes? Yes. Sir, uh, my question to you would be is, if you're going to do the first phase, and you've done the, uh, the first part of the architect, and then you do the schooling of you know, the construction, how long would it be for the second phase in order to get the other amount? Because this is a very large bond. Yes. And we'd like to know more or less, so the constituents say, well, how long is this going to take? How long is this going to take? Are they going to include some of the same things that the upper school got? Refrigerated yes, air, expand parking, okay, state of the art uh, computers, and those kind of things. So we don't want to be get second. Yes, if we no. want. We want. We want exactly what they're built. And and and, and that's what Miss Macias mentioned when the architects came down in uh, in 2016 in the spring and did the comparison. They use our newer high school as a comparison. So everything's gonna be uh, designed and based off our new high school. So we're gonna, you know, Socorro High School is gonna start, like I said, initially, the very first one, and it's gonna be continually going until it's finished. And hopefully it'll be in that two, less than three year time frame. And that's just phase one? No, that's the completion. That's the completion? That is the total, it's the, okay. yes. So the, the three sales of the bonds, it will be continuously, but we'll have enough money to, can, to start uh, Socorro in the first sale if it passes, and then continue on with it. There won't be an interruption no, in, in the construction no. of it, no. as far as the money is concerned, because you're no. just doing the construction anyway. No, it will be a continuous construction. A continu yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
At this time, can would you entertain a motion to move item number 11 and then item number 10 and continuing on in order? I'll make a motion to move up item number 11 in the agenda. Second. And number 10. Oh, yeah, exactly. Alfred, so it would be. Okay, we would do. Okay, so then. All right, I apologize. Then I'll, at this time, I'll go ahead and uh, make the motion to uh, move up items 10 and 11 on the agenda. Second. Second. Do we have a second? Yes, second. Rene Rodriguez? Aye. Maria Reyes? Aye. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. Which one are we going to do first? 11. 11. 11. I'm 11. 11. No, no, he said 10. No, said. Item number 11, discussion and action to approve submittal to the El Paso Thank Metropolitan you. Planning Organization Transportation Alternatives TA set aside program call for projects for fiscal year 2018 funds safe routes to school application and active transportation project application also to direct staff to create a resolution for the nominated projects to be approved by council with the commitment of the 20% contribution. Motion to approve item number 11 for discussion. Second. Rene Rodriguez. Aye. Maria Reyes. Aye. Aye. So why are we taking the Oh, for discussion. <laughs> okay, so she did take the vote. No, 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 we want the presentation because okay. you, that's what they need to know what, 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 okay. what it is. Uh, can we hold off on the, on the vote? Yeah, we, we'll yes. hold off on the vote. And can we change the motion? No, 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 I no, 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 we have to make the motion. We have to make the motion. We already made a motion. We were approving it. No, but we're taking the vote. No, 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 we're not going to take the vote. We're not going to take the vote. No, we're holding off on the vote. Yes, we're holding off on the vote. Carry on, yes. carry on. Okay, good, good afternoon, good uh, good honorable good council and mayor. Mm, we're here representing Denenbaum Engineering, your, your firm, engineering firm. My peer, Gabby Ramos, uh, professional engineer, and myself, Rossi Cardenas, public information officer for El Paso, Texas office. And uh, we were tasked by the city um, administration to apply to this um, to proceed, you know, to, to check into the, uh, the, new, the latest call for projects for the El Paso MPO, and this is, this is the transportation alternatives um, set aside program call for projects for fiscal year 2018 funds. The highlights of this project is, um, I provide you all the history there, however I understand that we're a little bit short on time, and I want to make it as brief as possible. Um, the most important thing in here is that it will um, help us with the continuity of the safe routes to school. And uh, basically this program um, uh, is applicable and eligible for the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure associated with safe routes to school projects that will substantially improve safety and the ability for students to walk and bicycle to school. Um, very nice to see that the district, Socorro Independent School District was here. Uh, we have received a letter, I wanted to thank them that they left. We have received a letter uh, uh, for support for this uh, for this uh, project, um, let me see. okay. Um, the highlights are that um, this is this uh, call for projects approximately ha um, provides a million seven hundred fifty-two thousand six hundred ninety dollars available to fund the construction phase of eligible set-aside program projects for the El Paso MPO planning area. Uh, the Transportation Planning uh, Board will be selecting projects and authorized funding levels um, of all the provided itemized budgets submitted by us in this case. The incoming, uh, the upcoming deadlines are October 18th to the 20th, which uh, will be tomorrow, <laughs> and uh, we'll be meeting uh, once, if you uh, approve, We'll be meeting with the MPO staff to provide them uh, the draft of the uh, uh, applications for, for submittal uh, of the following week, where we will be contacting uh, schools to support this project. So October 27, that's when it closes. Wanted to provide you a really quick overview of uh, what this will entail, or what this will cover. 
uh, we, the administration selected three of the schools, which are the Campestre Elementary School, um, the, I, let me see, go back. Yes. So uh, three of the schools that were fund, okay, in the last Save Us to School uh, pri um, project that was submitted, uh, which it was phase two, not uh, these three schools didn't, were, they were not given as much funds, so not all the plan was able to be completed. So the most important areas were the ones that were, um, um, I guess, uh, funded at the time, or were, yeah. So um, what we're doing with, with this, uh, what we'll be applying or we'll be proposing to improve for the Campestre Elementary would be the, the streets that you see there on the, on the screen, which would, uh, in red, I'm sorry, Jenny Red, uh, Jenny Road, Laney <coughs> Road, Ellen Road, Doris Road. Let me just go really quick here. This is the budgets, and basically what we're, what the city is proposing to, to improve is the five inch wide concrete sidewalks, curb ramps, driveway adjustments, um, and miscellaneous, miscellaneous items such as uh, utility signs and mailboxes to accommodate for, for sidewalks. The, the other school is Ernesto Serna Elementary School and Robert Rojas. All this, uh, yeah, all of the budgets that were uh, put together for these items total less than what is, you know, what is offered for the call. So hopefully, you know, that'll be a good high for us there. So for Campestre, the total amount is $130,719.12. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that's the match that, that the city of Socorro will have to put, I'm sorry. The total um, construction cost will be, oh, the total project, I'm sorry, will be $653,595.60. The local match, or the amount the, so the city of Socorro will have to put for this project for the Campestre Elementary School proposed improvements will be $130,719.12. For the Ernesto Serna, the total um, project cost is $302,973, uh, and the local match will be $60,594.60. And for the Robert Rojas, project, the total project cost is 454,780.38 and approximately 20 local match is $90,956.08. What uh, we're seeking today, uh, what the administration seeking today is uh, your ratification uh, to um, the resolution perhaps that will stipulate that uh, the city of Socorro will the city of Socorro will commit to provide the required federal match for this project, and these are needed needed uh, improvements in the area, as they were not covered before. Um, Mr. Perez, and I'm totally for these projects. I do think that one project may have been overlooked or should have been included or considered. Uh, it would have been. Um, Escontillas Elementary uh, because there is severe flooding there when it rained. There is a lack of, there's a lack of um, sidewalks on Rio Vista Road and uh, you have a lot of students that walk to the high school and so it would not only be for, for the elementary kids but for the high school kids as well. And so I think that there's, uh, I don't know what the process would be at this point but certainly for any, other, any future funding uh, cycles that's something that I would really like for, for uh, Socorro to focus on. And normally we always add all of the schools, um, but the funding was a lot lower this time around. Mm -hmm. And these are the three schools that got very uh, small portions of sidewalks in our last phase. That's why we included them. You know, we t they took priority just because the other ones had gotten a little bit of more miles right. into it. But we can definitely change if you want to add Escontrias and change it to something different. I don't want to the process now, no, no, but, but I do want to make it known that yes. for the next funding cycle, if there is one, because grants are the way they are, um, I would love for the Escuantillas area to be included because it is, there, there's severe flooding. 
uh, you have kids walking in the, when it rains, it really rains, and you have students that not only would use it uh, that uh, commute or walk to the elementary school, but would use it to also probably get to, to, the, um, to the high school via the canal. So again, I, those are things that I would like to, to have considered for next funding cycle, not necessarily now, because I understand the process, but that's something that I would like to the last call. I'm, I'm sorry, the last call for projects, uh, to answer your question, the, we, we submitted uh, various schools, because we, you know, we were, you know, we, we've seen the, the say routes, I mean, um, the safe route to school plan, you know, and we want it to be, provide continuity as we have in tasks. But um, the, the, I guess the funds went somewhere else, and uh, this time around, that was uh, May 2017, so <laughs> these are for funds for 2018 fiscal year. But we're, you know, hoping that, you know, we continue on getting funds for here for our Thank area. You. Thank you. Mr. Rodriguez? Yeah. <clears throat> one, one of the things is uh, it's, it's very important for us to apply for these because like, like the, she stated before, they moved funds around and they took it for call for uh, 17. One of the, the things uh, to answer your question, uh, Mr. Pettis, is that w we, we did take it upon ourselves to do a safe routes to school plan, but we have to do a citywide. Right. The reason why is because on this one, it also includes areas where they're not for safe routes as well. So there is gonna be a, 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 a mechanism from what I was told is that in the future they're gonna be able to, but there's one specular, there's only one thing about it is that um, they have to be shovel ready projects if we wanna go outside of uh, the, uh, the safe routes to school. Mm -hmm. For example, we have to do our engineering ourselves, we have to do and pay for um, our um, environment. environmental and stuff like that so that basically they will give us the we would apply for the funding to build that's it so i mean that's something that we that's what i was thinking of bringing after the november election so that we can do a a more comprehensive plan citywide so that we can say these are the because we don't want to go overboard and and apply for something that we're not going to be able to we also have to have the money for the 20 percent. those are the things and when you say that you have to be ready uh, uh, to start these projects, um, if not, they'll, they'll take away our funding. So I mean, that's, those are things that I'm gonna bring up after the November elections, so that you know, we don't know what the outcome's gonna be. And I understand that, and I, and I, and I appreciate that, but I, I, what is the, the parameter or the uh, perimeter for, for safe practice schools if you're saying that these are outside of the no, safe no, I'm, I'm saying some, some like others. No, like there's areas like, um, um, you know, it's a two mile. A two mile radius. Yeah. No. So anything that falls outside, there's gonna be future plan, uh, they're, they're speculating there's gonna be future um, for us to go out there and apply for them. No, but, but that's my, my point to the contrary is that um, the area near um, uh, Escondida School is very close. Mm -hmm. And so again, those are, the, those are areas that are I mean, it's a main street. It, uh, it's Rio Vista and, and uh, Buford. And so those are areas that those are where kids walk all the time. Yeah. And so my concern is exactly that, that being so close to the school and yet there is no sidewalk afforded to the students to walk on. And so again, my concern is that for next funding cycle, not my concern, but my, my uh, what I'm voicing is that for next funding cycle, I would like for that to be considered. And we will. Ms. Alvarez, my concern, and I, I love, you know, I love these projects. We need them. My concern is um, the the um, the construction, uh, the quality, quality. I mean, because we could put them out there, and you know, six months later, a year, they're already cracked, and they have, you know, uh, weeds coming out of them. That's one. Two. There's some. Uh, in my district, District Four, there's uh, there's a, there's one street that I can think of right now um, that instead of helping the residents, it hurt them because now the wall, the water, when it rains, the water does not flow out; it stays in their yard. It stays, it, it goes in their home because of these sidewalks. So um, the other one is, I believe, in front of Mrs. Uh, Escontrias, there is a sidewalk, but it is so low that when it rains, you don't see it. The kids are walking on the streets. So the quality <coughs> is very, very important. How they are uh, 
going to be laid out is very, very important. Um, and th that they realize that they're not gonna hinder the residents um, with putting these sidewalks. Does that make sense? Yes, um, we, ha we have talked about this. Um, it's kind of hard to address the drainage issues with these projects because they don't, um, they're strictly for you know, sidewalks. So any incidentals, like, like I said, the uh, adjustment of maybe water valves or um, mailboxes, that has to be an incidental and it can't be more than 30% of the total project cost. So the drainage issue sometimes can be a little bit cost prohibitive, but we are adding um, kind of like uh, swales alongside the, the sidewalk so that the water from the street doesn't go towards the property. So we're kind of stopping it at the sidewalk, but anything beyond the sidewalk, which would be the property's owner's um, right of way, yes, it, it would stay there. Most of these houses were meant to be for on-site ponding, mm -hmm. so it's really hard to be able to get the water out from their houses to, to a street that may be higher than, than their house. So that's kind of the issues that we will look at it. Um, we'll try our best to, be, to address it. We're also adding for these projects um, driveways. Um, they are gonna be there. If they, there's any existing driveway, we'll adjust it to make it ADA. And um, we've even provided a few several ones that they may not have their driveways. So. How about the quality? Because <laughs> we're always being compared yeah. that the quality is very cheap, very thin comparing to other communities in El Paso. Yes, and unfortunately, because it's funding, it's, it's federal funding, they always go with the lowest bid. They can't, uh, normally when we do our procurement, uh, we'll go with the you know most recommended one or the best quality. With TxDOT, they don't do that. It, it has to be the lowest bidder. And sometimes construction companies do come out. I mean, they meet all the specs. However, they do have to go with that construction company. And that's just because, that's pretty much what you, when you get grants, you have to follow those federal guidelines. That's what TxDOT approves, and this, this will be a, a TxDOT managed yeah, project. I, there should be like a year warranty in the contract, to where if anything cracks before the year, they, they have to come back and address it. And they do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Duran? About the quality. I've seen some sidewalks in Campestre area that are already buckled like this. Um, what guarantees are we going to have that the engineering of it is going to be proper, that there's going to be enough rebar, enough um, reinforcement to keep it from buckling? And also on the, um, I'm kind of, it says proposed improvements, five inch wide concrete sidewalks. Is that a typo? Five inch wide, it's only that big? It's five feet. I'm okay. Sorry. Yes. I was going to say that's. I am sorry, yeah. It's uh, not that I, wide. That's a typo. <laughs> Those are sidewalks it's, pretty good. Yeah. yeah. It's a tight, <laughs> it's a tight <laughs> rope. <laughs> but that's one thing that, um, that I'm worried about is the quality. The quality, yes. Uh, are you going to be having, and who is going to be uh, guaranteeing that the quality is there? Uh, we're. Well, they're managing the project, but um, I guess the design has to be a good design, um, a good set of plans. Um, so it's something, you know, if it's quality, then you'll have that in construction. If, if you can write your plan to a contractor, there's no way, there's no other way for him to do it but that way. And then also have a good uh, construction management, uh, an inspector, someone to be out there and continuously making sure that they're following this plan the correct way. Um, as a designer, I would say the, the buckling of the concrete sometimes is caused by the water itself. So like I said, we are adding swales along there, um, adding maybe some like gravel, I don't know, with, with some textile under it to, to keep it there. Um, just looking at several options that we may have that are not too expensive that we can still use them for this funding. Because uh, uh, there's one project that the city did where all the concrete sideways or sidewalks cracked, the, the um, curbs cracked, and the, the contractor just came and patched them. 
Now, if, if this is, if we have cracking, is it going to be patched or replaced? No, no, that's, that's entirely up to you. You can tell the contractor you need to fix the right way. Not, no patching. You cannot accept that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, one more question. Are the engineering part, once you have it ready, is that something that the council would vote on or you just move forward with the project? Um, any design firm that would submit their plans would have to go through review for, through planning. Okay. But right now, this is what we're submitting. It's due on October 27th. We met with Techstat today, and we will be meeting with MPO tomorrow, so we can submit on the 27th, which is next week. Okay. okay. Thank you. Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Item number 10, discussion and action of preliminary subdivision plat approval for Vista Bonita Estate subdivision being tracked by Block 24, San Elisario Grant. Motion to deny uh, per uh, staff recommendation. Second. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Vista Bonita subdivision. <coughs> this is, uh, I have provided you a couple of copies. Uh, one of them has four sets. Um, according to the engineer, they were gonna start subdividing, or they were gonna start developing the subdivision phases. On the, one of the sets that has all the red marks, these are some of the recommendations that we had agreed on with the engineer. And uh, we had a couple of meetings with some of the residents around the affected areas. And it seems like uh, uh, all the neighbors oppose this project. Um, on the sheet that has the red marks, the page number two, this is one of the on one of the meetings that we had with some of the residents from Rancho Viejo, the engineer had agreed, or the owner of the, of the development had agreed to build a solid rock wall along the perimeter. There is currently an existing 45 foot easement along the Rancho Viejo subdivision. Another one of the conditions that they agreed on was they were gonna re replat the entire Rancho Mirabal to vacate some of the stub outs that were there for future developments. Um, uh, where you see the red mark where it says option number two, that is an additional 45 foot easement that the city requested from this proposed development so that we can create a future 90 foot uh, major arterial. According to the information that uh, the the engineer provided us. They tried to negotiate the land adjacent to this development and <clears throat> they said that the owner of the property refused to sell a portion of the land to complete the, com the 90 foot arterial all the way to North Loop. Um, the other thing that was requested from them was to, instead of uh, doing on-site ponding, um, we were gonna ask for some public ponds uh, because one of the concerns that was brought up was every time it rains because it's clay soil, it takes a long time for the water to percolate and it creates a mosquito hazard. And in the last meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended to deny this subdivision. Thank you. And I know the residents have a presentation for you all. Just 
Mr. Perez. And, and just so that, that we are all clear and, and for some clarification, unfortunately or fortunately, however you see it, the state of Texas is very property owner friendly. And so once uh, a property has been approved for development, let's say that it went from agricultural to a residential zoning, but pretty much any municipality, whether it's a Socorro or a Paso, mm -hmm. their hands are tied in terms of the process that, it, that, that they begin in terms of developing that property. Um, and, and that's irrespective of the infrastructure. If so, and I, we, I, I think, I, uh, along with my colleagues, are, are in agreement that our infrastructure and the streets, our roads, are, is not enough. It's not adequate. We know that. But unfortunately, when you have developers that, that have already gained their subdivision approval or have gained the, the, the zoning approval, then they go at their speed. And unfortunately, we're always trying to catch up. And that's just, I mean, it's not an excuse, but that's the way the state operates. And so it's very, we understand and we hear, well, we need to think about the streets. And believe me, we are the first ones that will fight for the streets. But the thing is that we also are obliged and obligated, rather, to follow what the state requires. And so that's, I just want to make that point, that clarification, that it's not that we're not trying to work on the infrastructure. It's just that sometimes the development is faster than what we can uh, update our infrastructure because of, of, the, of the state laws. Any speakers? David Estrada. Okay. Thank you. My name is David Estrada. Um, I, I heard what you said. I, I understand um, uh, property rights, we, and the state of Texas is, is open to that, very lenient. Not, well, they protect property rights owners, but on, on the same token, the residents of Rancho Mirabal have rights as well. Uh, so I, I want to just take a little bit of your time, sh go through some slides real quick. Uh, I don't mean to disrespect anybody. I do apologize if I do. Okay, there's going to be some pictures as well that uh, the picture's worth a, a thousand words. Okay? Thank you. Um, most of the, uh, the people here at, uh, from Rancho Mirabal think this is a real easy decision. It's black or white, right or wrong. It's a real common sense decision, and, and I'm one of those people, but... Uh, Maybe that's because we don't understand all the laws or all the procedures that you guys are, are following. But it's still a common sense right or wrong decision. The zoning board uh, recommends no and all the, all the residents say no. Uh, the zoning board are people that, uh, that, you, that you guys appointed, they're appointed people and we were here two weeks ago and they all had good comments, good suggestions and they're all saying no. So. I'll continue. Uh, the zoning board is asking for a community park, uh, and this is stuff that they mentioned and kind of took notes a couple of weeks ago. Okay, they're uh, wanting a ponding area within the proposed subdivision, uh, the infrastructure like you stated, uh, additional time for review, and the streets aren't wide enough. Mr. Estrada, your time is up. Mr. Duran? I'd like to uh, make a motion to suspend the rules to allow him to finish his... Uh, Proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Reyes? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. Ivan Colon Villalobos? Uh, before I vote, I just need to let everyone know that I am a resident of uh, Rancho Mirival. I live on Los Adobes and I am with the constituents. Yes. Thank you. Um, the zoning board is asking, is also stating that uh, the streets aren't wide enough in Rancho Mirabal. Uh, if you allow them access, if they get access, that means our streets need to be widened. It affects everybody. None of us want that. We don't want the sidewalks that I know of, at least I don't. Um, 
zoning board is saying that uh, somebody on the zoning board stated that Rancho Miraval should be the model community for all future developments, uh, smart growth, infrastructure should be in place first, and then uh, they also are saying that this item should be tabled for further review so that the zoning board and, and council should review as well. Those, these are things that the zoning board stated during that meeting. Uh, what city council should be asking for, and these are items that pro uh, I believe other people that are going to speak are going to ask for, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move through these. Uh, there, there's a traffic study on here. Somebody addressed that earlier. There's a train study. Nobody's mentioning that train. That train stops on Burr Bridge. It stops there for hours at a time. All that traffic is going to be rerouted somewhere. Uh, Instead, what I've heard members of city council say, and again, I don't mean any disrespect, I'm just taking notes and I don't understand the process, okay? But I've heard city council members say that they're afraid of a lawsuit, that they've met all the requirements like you were talking about earlier, that we have to enforce ordinances and, and uh, that we have to abstain from voting. The people on this side of the aisle, we don't understand what you're saying. I mean, it, it's, again, it's just common sense to us, okay? Uh, let's look at some ordinances that should be enforced. Uh, this is an ordinance, an ordinance back in 2002, uh, November 7, 2000, 2002. It was passed by City Council back then. And it's basically saying that uh, City Council pledges to do the right thing. From what I know, this is an existing ordinance. I may be wrong, I don't know. Um, this is uh, Trent Road. That's my dog, Tucker. A lot of my neighbors like my dog. Uh, illegal dumping is bad. This stuff has been out there since I moved in. It's about three years already. This has been out there maybe a couple of years. This is within the city limits of Socorro, so I'm, I don't know all the ordinances, but there's probably an ordinance against this, uh, rock walls that aren't finished, abandoned trailers. This is also within the city limits of Socorro. People actually live here. Uh, backyards, as mine, my backyard can also, should also be clean, but this is somebody's horse stalls. Okay, I didn't take a picture of the horse because he was, Inhumane, let's say that. It was beyond repair. But this is somebody's horse stall within the city limits of Socorro on a 5,000 square foot lot, zoned R3. This is also an R3 zoning, about 5,000 square feet. There's about 200 fighting roosters. Uh, rock walls that are falling, graffiti. So, like you mentioned, ordinances that, that you need to follow. Well, there's a lot of a lot of other ordinances that that just aren't enforced. Um, other neighbors within Socorro have fought and won situations like this. Uh, corner of Rio Vista, and North Loop. There's a post office, uh, storage units, and, and the senior living community. This right here is a corner of Rio Vista, and North Loop. This is a Chevron. This com there's a community here. This is a post office and storage units. Well, this subdivision or this developer right here wanted to build some, some uh, independent living for seniors, and they were accessing or wanting to access this road. This community has been here a long time. So I don't know all the details, but what I'm told by some of these community members, they fought this a long time ago, probably 15 years ago. And they stopped this developer from accessing this road and they had them, this is, this is I think it's three missions, so it goes between the post office and the, uh, the storage units and it accesses these, these, uh, these homes right here. There's, I mean, I can't count that quick, but there's probably like 40 homeowners here, I guess, I don't, I don't know how many. But in comparison, what this developer is asking is for you to allow this is Rancho Miraval right here. Well, this, all this land right here, this is Pecan Grove. 
Uh, I, I believe there's 520 lots. This section right here is where the train stops. All these people are going to come through Tres Caballos and down Rancho Mirabal. You saw a slide earlier that said common sense. It just does not make any sense to allow it. It just, it, it, it's beyond my comprehension. I'm gonna show some pictures. Um, about 30 years ago, I think these uh, covenants for Rancho Mirabal were set back in probably the late 60s, early 70s. And there was a developer back then who had a vision a very smart man, those who knew him uh, probably did very well. And he had a vision for what Rancho Miraval should look like 30 years from then, and he wrote up those covenants to make sure that his vision was, was completed the way he wanted it. And um, here's a couple of pictures of the homes that we have. Here's a couple of pictures of the result of, of that developer's vision. All these homes are in uh, Rancho Mirabal. Notice the American flag, we, we like that. There's uh, two homeowners, I believe one of them is present right now. Uh, the two of our newest neighbors bought land and, and built their house probably within the last 12 months. And this is what they've built within the last 12 months. So in comparison, um, Pecan Grove is right next to the subdivision that, that we're talking about, okay? And uh, I'm gonna show you some pictures. Again, I don't mean any disrespect. I have friends that live in this community, a lot of subcontractors. But this is what bad decisions look like five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now. Uh, this is what a bad developer is gonna sell. This is what you're voting for or against. Uh, somebody earlier mentioned a legacy. Well, this is a legacy that what your vote is gonna, is gonna leave. You leave a, each vote is a, is a footprint on Socorro or a fingerprint. And it doesn't go away, it's there forever. And to change it, if you don't in, impose restrictions on a developer, uh, there's a city council that's gonna be here probably 25 years from now asking why in the world did the city of Socorro do this? Why would they allow this? If you allow a developer to build without, uh, or with, with on-site ponding, there's a typo right there, uh, without parks and restricted covenants, good builders, builders that are gonna build to completion like Classic, Saratoga, Desert View, they're not gonna buy these lots. So the option for the developer is to sell seller finance. So seller finance is a bad decision, bad developers, and a ba it leaves a bad legacy. Uh, these homes fall in, in no man's land. It's a county from what I understand. They're not within the city of Clint. They're not within the city of Socorro. There's no building code enforcement, no city ordinances. I don't believe they say pay city taxes. I wonder who their um, school taxes are gonna go to. I think it's Clint. Here's some samples of, of what people who buy on a seller finance note develop this developer will sell on a seller finance note. I've been asking and asking what this developer intends to do and he, the answer that I get is he's going to continue to or, or offer it to anybody. But builders are not gonna buy the uh, lots with on-site ponding. It's too much of a liability and too much of a cost to correct it. So 520 home sites on seller finance, this is, this is a, a sample. We have a community that, that was sold on seller finance there in Pecan Grove. Look at the color of the, uh, of the plywood, the dead tree on the, on the right, and the height of the weeds. This home's been sitting there a long time. I'm 
this house uh, burnt recently, uh, you can assume maybe, you know, that lack of building codes might have caused this fire. Uh, for example, no inspections, electrical inspections during the construction process. This is actually a store that's in operation. If you look right here, there's an open sign and they've got this prepped for a marquee sign. This is within the subdivision of Pecan Grove. Uh, people add on without permitting. They add on to their footprint. Uh, there's, there's no ordinance else, is, is out there. The city of Socorro won't be controlling their, their ins inspectors. They won't be going out there to enforce this. Okay, I want to do the math a little bit. Uh, 520 home sites, 25,000 per site roughly that I know of. It might be less, maybe a little more. That's 13 million in sales. If you sell or finance each one of these 10% on a 20 year term interest on a lot alone, if they carry out their 20 year, year term is 32.9 on interest alone. You multiply the 32.9 by 520 home sites, you have 17.1 million in interest. Add that to the 13 million and you get a potential gross of 30.1 million. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. It's gross, he's got development costs, we understand. Um, the other thing I wanna add is that from where we stand and what we're looking at, the, the city council here in Socorro has a lot of power. Uh, developers are landlocked in, in El Paso. Uh, the city of El Paso is landlocked. They have nowhere to grow. So all these cotton fields are very attractive to developers and builders. Uh, I think you guys can easily dictate to these developers uh, what and how to develop. If they would only want to. I, uh, I'm going to leave the on-site ponding to somebody else. Thank you very much for your time. Bernie mm -hmm. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the ponding issue for this development and the proposals that they have there. This is uh, on-site ponding. We get a lot of rain. We get a lot of mosquitoes. On a 2,500 square foot footprint on a 43,560 square foot lot is about 5%. It's actually closer to 7 to 8 after you add all the uh, driveways, uh, sheds, and that type of thing. The proposed division, subdivision, they are 1,500 square foot print on a 10,000 square foot lot. That's 15%. It goes back to what I just finished saying. This is what you get. This rain gauge I have in front of my house, uh, this is actually from August of this year. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you were out there, Coker Road, and so was other council members out there as well, assisting with people. This is what we had to deal with. Uh, on this day, it was a little over two and a half inches. Uh, the following week, once again, uh, three and a half inches. After that, almost two and three eighths, I mean, uh, two and seven eighths inches of rain. And then we had a one inch. This is that day that it was actually raining. It's, it's that Saturday afternoon. It was pouring. Once again, we have one acre tracks. Our footprint is minimal in comparison to what's being Mr. Salcido, your time is up. Thank you so much. Damien Pilatsky. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council again. Um, 
ponding, you've, you mentioned that you get to a point where it's already been approved. Steps need to be taken before things get to that point. When we make requirements that the only thing that a developer has to do is make plans for egress that are in the future, which may be 30, 90, 100 years in the future, that doesn't solve the problem now. That could have been paid, you know, the, the things that were talked about now could have been talked about then. They, the developer says they can't uh, do, create a large common pond because of the water table. Well, that's not true. You can raise the elevation of the property and then you're above that water table so you can do it. It would only take 50, a fleet of 50 10 ton trucks, 10 trips a day for 300 days to raise the elevation enough so that it makes a common pond. There are things that they don't look at because it's not in their interest. They want to put the costs on you and on us. We need to make the decisions ahead of time so that we don't get to a point where the city and the people of Socorro are paying for the greed of a developer. Mr. Pilaski, your time is up. Lincoln Wallace. Kind of being new to the process, I think um, going forward, I don't know what the format is for transparency. Uh, maybe um, something is set up in terms of a town hall or something whereby the rest of us uh, normal people, uh, regular folks can kind of get some insight into what you guys are faced with so that when you are making your decisions, we can know that by good faith that, we, that you guys are um, looking out for our best interest. Not that we wouldn't, but since we aren't available to the process, something as simple as when we were sitting here, we weren't privy to the plans that he was showing. And we're looking at, okay, you have that information, but we don't. So uh, going forward, maybe that will assist in giving us more information. So some of the questions that we do have, we won't even waste our time because we already know the answer that you've reviewed it and everybody's kind of on the same sheet of music. Jesus Cabrera. Just for, uh, for the record, I live on Tres Caballos Street. That's where actually this developer wants to get in. Can you imagine a car every three minutes? Can you live with a car passing your house every three minutes? You saw the numbers, millions of dollars, they can do anything they want. That easy. If the other person doesn't want to sell, well, it's their problem. But the only thing I want to say is, we vote for you. This is a time that you need to respond to us. Because otherwise, probably, a lot of people are not going to vote nothing, or nobody's going to vote for you guys again on November. It's going to be a lot of problems. Either the developer is going to go through with Rancho Mirabal, or if they're not going to develop the, the, the land. We're going to be in problems anyway. So I don't want to have a car every three minutes passing through my house. So take a wise decision. Because uh, we're going to have to still living. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I'll stop a lot of projects that I've been doing. Just yeah, because I'm telling no, I know what is going to happen. I can't even fence on my property. I've been thinking to fence on it for over 20 years. Now, is it, when is the time to do it that I, I have the time to do it, I cannot do it because I don't know what's going to happen. Mr. Cabrera, your time is up. <coughs> Sandy Saucedo. Joey Sanchez. Naomi Scott. All I can say is that we really do hope that you do take in advice, not just your constituents, but your planning and zoning. You have hired them for a reason. Listen to them, they are telling you something. I know that there's other rules that you have to go by, but you have to make the right decision. You have to listen 
to what everybody is saying. We can't all be wrong, <coughs> especially the people that you have hired, your planning and zoning. Help us, help them to make the right decision and you will make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Johnny Tellez. Salvador Griego. Jose Gonzalez. I'm so glad that we were here at this meeting today uh, just to understand what the Socorro Independent School District is already facing. They want to bring in 520 homes to that subdivision. Where are these children going to go to school? What sidewalks are they going to walk on? You're talking about the developments that are already there and are falling apart. You want to build a, a six foot rock wall behind our subdivision. Is it going to look like the picture that was up there anytime soon? You know, when are we going to fix tomorrow's problems today? That's why you're sitting here. You guys can make a change. And I hope you do. Thank you. Tony Valdez. Uh, thank you for listening to us. Uh, I really appreciate that. I know that there's policies, rules, and regulations, um, all the things that we might not understand. But we do understand common sense. And basically what we're seeing here is a recipe for disaster. I mean, all these new homes will bring a lot more problems onto your plate that you would have to deal with. And, and we would have to deal with it as well because we live in that area. Now, this is the time to make the difference. This is the time to stand up as we've st stood up and, and addressed our concerns with you. So it's now your, your turn to show us Make our vote count, because that's who we voted. We had faith in you. We st I still do, no doubt about it. I know that you have to follow your rules and regulations, but, but still, we have to do it the right way. And the right way is listening to your constituents, listening to the people that you hired zoning. They understand what needs to be done, and, and let's do it. But let's do it the right way. It's all about progress, it's all about legacy, it's all about making the right decisions. And you saw the pictures there of the wrong decisions. And I definitely would not want to live in an area, I mean, no disrespect to, to the people that do live there, but yeah, it's, it's a little run down. Mr. Vandes, you. your time is up. Those are all our speakers. Mr. Duran? I've been looking at this for a few days now. And it says that uh, it does not include a public park. We have a parks master plan that I've been going over. And we're so behind on the amount of public parks that we need. We're way behind. When you, uh, when you look at a place that you, they have these different sites, and they gauge how, what city, if you want to live there. And one of the biggest things they talk about is the amount of public parks. This subdivision has not one single park in it. It doesn't have, you know, that calls for on-site ponding. What about the water in the streets? Where is that going to go? We need to have drain fields where, where drainage ponds. That could double as parks. We have them already. But they need to be able to... Uh, take in that much water, and I realize there's clay. So there's gonna, they're going to have to design it so that the water will percolate down. Another thing that I'm looking at is there's another subdivision behind this one. Those people there have to get out of this property too. I don't see one single road in the middle of this subdivision to get people in and out of it. The subdivision is in the county, if I'm not mistaken. Eventually, we will annex it. And I think we need to make sure that everything's in place now before annexation does happen. Because Socorro is growing. We've already annexed, and we'll be annexing again. If we do not make sure that this subdivision is done properly, like you said, it, it's going to happen. But if we make it happen in the right way, then everybody will be served. 
we need to make sure that it has a park that will supply the demand of the people that are living in the area. Our parks master plan, we're, we're way, way behind on where we need to be. The street, I, I, don't see another, I don't see it going anywhere in the, in the subdivision. All they want to do is feed off of a street that's in Socorro. This is in the county. They need to build their own street down the middle or down the other side. We have enough people in Socorro using the streets that we have. We don't need to have another 500, 500 house, 520 houses. If you multiply that by two cars per house, which I, I, I mean, I think everybody here is a two car household. That's over a thousand cars gonna use a Socorro street, whereas there's nothing on the other side. I think this needs to be redone. I think it needs to take into consideration the needs of the community that, it's, that they're building. They're building a community here. 520 houses is a lot of people. They need to take into consideration parks. They need to take into consideration where the water from the streets is gonna flow because I don't see anywhere on here where the water, you know, they're talking about on-site um, ponding areas. Uh, mosquitoes. I think how many people have been bit here by mosquitoes because of ponding water. That water needs to go into a, a central pond where it can be taken care of. And then a lot of things need to happen. They're talking about um, the streets. Well, North Loop is, is TxDOT. We can't, we can't do anything about North Loop. So that's a two-lane road. There's gonna be a two-lane road going into these properties. That's a lot of cars for two lanes. This needs to be rethought, it needs to be redone, and then brought back to us. Thank you. Mr. Rodriguez. <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez. Well, I got a couple of things to say. Um, this issue, I know, been, been going back for years. Um, but I want to touch on uh, Mr. Duran's thing. You know, you haven't looked at the Parks Master Plan because they haven't presented to us. Or does he have a copy of it? That's right. Of the draft? Okay, well, the draft's not even done. But I think that we all should take a look at it before that. One of the things is that I will say is, you know, I, one, I, I want to say that that was a nice PowerPoint. Two, I like it that uh, you emphasize that it's black and white or common sense and stuff. And it's one of those things that I like. One of the things that I will critique it is that you're doing a disservice to yourself by putting the amount of money that the developers to stand because if we don't allow him to do whatever he has the right that's the money that we're going to end up paying him for not putting that development in there now regardless of what you guys think it goes back to the same thing some of you said and came up here oh we don't know the law and we don't know a lot of stuff well that's what i'm trying to tell you our attorney, and that's exactly what I'm going to tell him right now, ask him right now, is what are, Jim, what are the options that we have if we deny this? What's the outcome of that? You've got a number of options. The first, the first depends on what's happened so far. And one thing I'd like to discuss with you is Okay. So you can answer me if we don't allow this development and he's already has his are we going to be liable? It, yeah, I mean, it depends. It, it depends. Depending on what's been done so far, what information our engineering firm has asked for. I mean, it's okay to work down with the engineering firm <coughs> for this show, too. Again? Because I, 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 I want them to understand where we're at because I don't, I don't want them to, to you know, uh, and I, I get it. Some of you came back and, and told us that our commissions 
um, are in favor of not making the development, but what, and that they have a lot of things that they want to ask for. But one of the things is, is that people tend to forget that our commission is there to obey our laws and to make sure that they're abide by, by the developers. Not to come up and say, oh, I want this and I want that. I mean, it's something that we're asking, we're helping. We understand that, uh, believe me, I love your homes. Love your homes, I've said it and I'll keep saying it. I don't think that it's fair for 520, you know, uh, residents to use your, your, your street. But unfortunately, the way it is and it's structured, I mean, they can draft it everything they want, but I mean, um, it's something that we, we talked to the developers, it's something that we, we, we found ways. Um, we had meetings for the other gentleman that asked that, uh, where's our meetings? You can look at it in our website on Mondays before the uh, uh, Thursday, and you can see all the backup, everything that are shown to us, so that you'll know. The only thing you will not see in those backups on our website is what we talk in executive. That's about the only thing. Um, uh, and like I said, it will always be up on the website on Monday before the meeting. Um, uh, one of the things also that I wanna uh, touch is, you know, I, I understand, I understand completely. I've been there with you from the start. You know, I, I had to do so much stuff. I, I came back and, and, and we looked at the best outcome. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, uh, on on the meeting with uh, planning and zoning, I mean that's something that uh, we're going to have to address. I don't want people to get false hopes because our planning and zoning commissioners aren't qualified, don't understand our rules and regulations and our you know procedures, and that's something that we face because there's not enough qualified individuals, or even for that matter, we don't even have people that want to come to our commissions, okay, and that's the truth. I mean, you know, I, I, I will say it, you know, a million times. I'm not here for legacy projects. I'm not here because I wanna have a legacy of, I did this and I did that. I'm not about here. I'm about here to move the city forward, make the best for our residents. I don't consider myself as a commissioner. I consider myself as a rep because I'm representing you guys. And that's what I'm going to do. Now, I understand that, you know what? And, and, I, and I tell people this all the time. I am not gonna tell you something that you wanna hear. I will never do that to you, to you or to anybody else. I will tell you the truth. And if the truth doesn't, you know, uh, kill you, it'll make you understand what I'm trying to tell you. And it's the truth. I, I, I will not hide behind anything. I will tell you the truth the way it is, the way the laws are, you know. I just, I just want you to understand that. I understand I don't like this situation. I don't want 520 residents using your subdivision. I don't, and that's where I stand. So I just want you to understand that this is the plan before us, and it's something that we are going to address. I just have to ask um, uh, Jim for some legal advice, something that you guys aren't gonna be able to, to hear, but. Like I said, anybody else wants to? Ms. Reyes? Talk? Okay, um, first, uh, I'm sorry, but I do disagree with you. I think our planning zone is doing a fantastic job with the abilities, with the information that's given to them. Um, I, they don't take their, their commission lightly. They're there for a purpose, and they do understand that the constituents come first before the developers. I do not mind growth. It's a way of life, but at the same token, it's a give and take situation. Now, if one is not willing, then that, that makes a very toxic environment within there. But what they're not looking at is that everybody's talked about the park, everybody's talked about where the ingress and egress is, all this. What about the safety issues? If there's a fire, there's no exits, if there's uh, uh, whatever type of an emergency, how is the in and out going to be? You know, I don't see anything other than that one road. Where is the emergency vehicles going to be mm -hmm. to able to get to you? My understanding is that, yes, I've been there. It's a gorgeous place, it is. And I know that you don't want it to change. But at the same token, 
you need to respect that this commission is there for a purpose, and their purpose is to make sure that they look for the citizens, look out for the citizens of Socorro. If we don't start abiding by what they recommend, we're gonna revert back 20, 30 years where they come in and do whatever, and you see what you get. I'm sorry, but I, I, I do not believe that um, the developers come first. We were elected to represent our constituents first. And that's my thought. Ms. Alonso. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. I, I did all what, what you say, uh, what you said, our, our planning and zoning. Uh, we, we appointed them for a reason. I think we, we saw that, uh, number one, they don't get paid. So they're there dedicating their time. Uh, they're not there to, uh, to, to get a paycheck. So obviously they're doing it because they, they're in it for the city. Um, I don't know why we keep going back and forth. I don't know when this uh, plot or plan or was approved, preliminary was approved or what was approved at the time. Here we get talking back and forth. We don't know what uh, the engineer presented at the time. Okay, we have no idea what they presented. But here we have six items, six very important items that have not been brought forth. And here we are spending all our time going back and forth. They have not complied. The, here we are a year later. I don't know when it was approved. I, I hear it was <coughs> councils before. They have not complied. We should not even be here talking about it. If they're not complying now, they're not going to comply then. Now these lots, these lots are not for developers. They're for individuals. They're not for developers. If it was developers, it'd be, you know, um, a better situation. But I will also tell you that our um, sometimes developers for these type of lots, uh, when they're not custom, uh, the homes look good for five years, and then after five years, they start falling apart. The, the, the you know, the stucco starts falling, the roof is flying, and and the neighborhood looks awful. So. Can we give them a time frame to comply with all these requirements, or can we just kill it? How, how much longer are we going to go back and forth? Mr. Martinez? Well, we just can't go back and forth. We, it, you know, they should have complied a long time ago. And, um, and, and again, we need to go back and find out originally when this plot was first uh, brought forth and find out what exactly did they say they were going to develop. Because just recently we found out these, these, weren't going, these lots weren't going, were not going to be sold to developers, developers but they were going to be owner financed. Um, to answer your question, this is the, the plan that you have in front of you. This is the exact same plan that was presented to the meeting that we had with the residents. Um, and it, it shows the recommendations that we were asking from them are in the new 